The anonymous Byzantine treatise on strategy is a military manual on the art of war as a whole. It is believed to have been written in the 6th century CE during the reign of Justinian. The first page of the manuscript is missing, so we do not know who the author of the treatise is. However, judging from some of his comments, he may have been stationed with Belisarius during his Italian campaign and thus been an eyewitness to the conflict. He wrote in practical, unembellished Greek, but not much else is known about him. There is much debate about his identity, specifically, what exact role he played in military affairs. Was he a military theoretician who had little real experience in combat and commanding troops? Was he a military engineer who played a role in building structures such as walls, camps, and fortifications? Or perhaps he was a staff officer or veteran who had first-hand experience in the art of war? All of these assertions are plausible and have been argued for by historians over the years, but unfortunately, we will never know the author's true identity unless a new manuscript is discovered that contains this information. Whatever the case, the anonymous Byzantine treatise on strategy is a valuable resource for those who wish to learn about the 6th century Byzantine military machine. The following are excerpts from the treatise. Tactics is a science which enables one to organize and maneuver a body of armed men in an orderly manner. Tactics may be divided into four parts. Proper organization of men for combat, distribution of weapons according to the needs of each man, movement of an armed body of troops in a manner appropriate to the occasion, the management of war, of personal materials, including an examination of ways and causes as well as what is advantageous. A phalanx is a formation of armed men designed to hold off the enemy. It may assume a variety of shapes. Nowadays, troops are often drawn up in square or oblong formations. All the soldiers stationed in the first rank are named protostate, or protostates, in relation to those behind them, and those in the second place are called epistate, or epistates, in relation to those ahead. Furthermore, each file by itself is called a squad, and its head is called a squad leader. Two squads are called a double squad, and its head is a double squad leader. Four squads form a tetrarchy, and its leader is a tetrarch. Twice that number is a taxarchy, whose chief is a taxarch. The front rank men, who we also call ilarchs and squad leaders, should stand out from the rest of the army because of their courage and physical strength for they have to bear the brunt of the hand-to-hand -hand fighting and wear such heavy armor. The rear guard should possess no less courage and physical strength than the men stationed in the second rank. They should also be notably superior to other troops in experience and good sense, for they are responsible for forming and keeping the men in their place in line. In action, moreover, they must keep the men ahead of them in close order so that the phalanx may maintain its compact formation and present a stronger and more formidable front to the enemy. After the rear guard come troops stationed on the files on the sides. They must guard the flanks against envelopments and encirclements, 
as well as surprise attacks by the enemy, which are often directed against them. When the troops have been formed as described, we must equip the front rank men with defensive armor to protect those parts of the body most exposed in action. Their shield should be no less than one and a half meters in diameter, so that when they are joined together, they form a solid defensive protection behind which the army can hide without anyone being injured by enemy missiles. Armor for the head, breastplates, and shin guard should be heavy enough to ward off injury, but not so heavy as to be burdensome and wear down the strength of the soldiers before they get into action. The spear should be as long as can be carried by an individual in the second, third, or fourth rank. When the phalanx is closed up then, the distance should be generally about two-thirds of a meter. This type of formation with the spears is called the Macedonian, for they are reputed to have made use of it. In a cavalry force, the file leaders, the four ranks in position behind them, the rear guards, and the troops on the edges of the ranks and the men next to them should have the same qualifications as their counterparts in the infantry as far as bravery, physical strength, and combat experience are concerned. In fact, their formation and also their armament should be the same. The cavalry phalanx, however, does differ from the infantry one. The latter is closed up very tightly, which gives it an irresistible weight as men crowd together and push one another forward upon the enemy. The cavalry phalanx, on the other hand, is loose and without such crowding, but it too possesses its own kind of forcefulness in attacking, since it does not fall upon the enemy in a slow or measured way, but charges at full speed. This charge is really terrifying to men who have not had years of combat experience. If we are superior to the enemy in numbers and in other respects not inferior, as they move into action we should envelop their flank to the extent dictated by our superiority. But if we are still somewhat stronger than this, there is no reason why we should not make the envelopment double. But the opposite may occur, that is, the enemy is planning to envelop one or both of our flanks. If our army is as big as the enemy's is reported to be, then we should be able to extend our phalanx along the front so that the enemy may not be able to fall upon either one of our flanks. But if our army is weaker than theirs, we should not stretch out our phalanx. If the army threatening to outflank us is composed of infantry, we should oppose it with infantry posted on the flanks of the phalanx. If it is a cavalry force, we should place caltrips all along and fire at it with javelins and arrows. If conditions are equal on both sides, and the victory could go either way, we should not advance into battle before the enemy have become inferior to us in some respect. This can be brought about if we fall upon them when they may be weary from just having finished a long march, or one through rocky and hilly country. We can fall upon them when they are in disorder, for example, setting up their tents or taking them down. The best time is when the enemy have broken up their units, owing to a lack of supplies or some other reason. Then we can attack those detachments one at a time. This is what Belisarius used to do. When the enemy force was so large that he was unable to face up to it, he would destroy the provisions in the area before they appeared. The need for supplies would force the enemy to separate their units one from another, and march along in several groups, and then he would defeat each unit by itself. By these methods, large armies have often been defeated by much smaller ones, not to mention by forces equally or nearly as strong.